and welcome to the 42nd episode of Recluse Horror. This is a daily horror movie review podcast. Uh, so just a little background on the project. Back uh, in on my birthday in April, I decided I wanted to watch and review a horror movie every single day. I have done so for the past 309 days. Although only the last 42 episodes have been podcasts, uh, before that it was text reviews. So each episode I talk about two movies, one of which I have watched that very night, and another that I reviewed previously in text, uh, where I just go over whatever impressions that I have left, uh, aided of course by the text review itself. So I had a ton of fun at the thing that I was uh, talking about doing yesterday. Um, it was it was super, super fun. Um, tomorrow I start actual training for my new job that I've been talking about and everything. Um, so uh, again, I just wanted to warn people there's, there's a very good possibility I'll start doing um, a lot more frequently, at least. I'll probably be doing um, short films. Uh, just as I, you know, depending on how overwhelmed I am with the training, um, I will still do my best, uh, you know, within everything within my power to try to, uh, do an episode every day. Uh, I don't foresee not, ho hopefully not being able to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, obviously, um, for right now, uh, my new job has to take priority. So, I mean, if, if something does come up or whatever, I'll let, you know, all two of you listening to this know on, you know, Twitter and Facebook and stuff, uh, if there's going to be a, an issue or if I'm going to have to do it, you know, later on in the day or, you know, something like that. So, um, anyway, so today I watched a movie called Dead Eyes Watching from 2017. Um, this is, uh, from writer, director Daniel McGuire, and you can find it for free, uh, through, uh, the Rising Films YouTube page. Uh, this is another full feature length movie. It's about, a, uh, I think it's an hour and five minutes, a uh, little over. And again, this is one of those ultra, ultra low budget, you know, bootstraps filmmaking, you know, sort of, sort of movies. Um, Daniel McGuire also plays the lead, uh, who is a person named Dominic, who, um, I don't really know exactly how to synopsize this. I don't know what is the best way to go about it with, like, in regards to spoilers. Um, I, I, I guess I would just say the movie starts off and there is a young man with a knife on the ground and some blood. I mean, usually I would give a better synopsis than that, but the rest of the movie is you kind of trying to piece together um, what's happened and why. So I actually think trying to synopsize it beyond that might be doing you a disservice. So there was a, a previous cut of this movie uh, with a different title called Psychopath from 2012. Um, it is apparently the cuts are pretty different. Um, it seemed like it anyway. I just sort of clicked through the other version of it, but I'd actually kind of be interested in seeing what that was really like. But as far as the version that, that I watched, uh, Dead Eyes Watching from 2017, uh, I was, I was pretty impressed with it. Um, there's definitely some, some problems. Some of the technical aspects really needed a little bit of help. But again, I think this is sort of, if I remember correctly, it said that this was like the first movie or maybe the first feature length movie uh, that Daniel McGuire had worked on. And uh, it's actually pretty impressive. Uh, he wrote the script and the script is actually one of the strongest elements of it uh, to me personally. Um, I And I that's that's the thing that I generally get the most excited for. Um, there, there are some problems with it, but it's very strong, especially for a first time filmmaker. And again, it's one of those movies where I feel like they took into consideration the budget and the the assets that they had available to them when they decided what when he decided to write this, uh, you know, thinking, well, I can get a hold of a house location. I can get, you know, get a hold of this. I know somebody who can do this, um, which I love in independent filmmaking. Um, when you do that, uh, I, I know I've mentioned it so many times in other reviews. So whether or not that's actually true. 
I, I have no idea, but it, it certainly seemed that way. Um, the script lends itself fairly well to what they did do with it, with uh, like not requiring a whole lot of effects or anything like that. Um, as far as as I was saying before, the technical elements, um, much like the the other um, the other one of these that, that I watched, it was the gosh uh, is in residence the five thousand dollar Kickstarter movie that I watched the other day. Um, this one is fairly similar. This had uh, a ten thousand dollar budget, um, so you know twice as much as those guys, but it's a different type of movie, and um, you know that's an, an extraordinarily low budget. I mean, I like. Uh, one of the short films that I, um, I, I worked on previously, uh, for, you know, a friend, a friend of mine had written a script and, and needed some hands and, and, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, that was a, I think it, it, it the, the final cut of it ended up being 10 or 15 minutes. It's been a long time since I've seen it. it had, this was a long time ago. Um, and that was, that was three thousand dollars i think so this is a feature length for ten thousand dollars and the other the kickstarter one was a feature length for five thousand dollars so they're both very impressive um i can't i honestly can't imagine us doing that that short film with any less money than we had so uh, i mean it's pretty crazy um so anyway the technical aspects I keep meaning to get to and getting distracted by stuff. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little off today. I've had a ton of coffee um, after having drank quite a bit last night um, and uh, miraculously waking up without a hangover. I don't know how. But uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I it, the te- technical aspects, the sound quality, much like in Residence, uh, was probably its its worst feature. Um, there is for a good portion of the movie, most of the stuff that happens in the main, the main filming location, uh, and a couple other places here and there. Um, every time you hear them speak, the, the background, uh, fuzz noise comes up and then it cuts out as soon as, as soon as they stop speaking. And it occasionally the background noise is different for, for each character, even though they're sp- supposed to be in roughly the same place. Um, or even, you know, just having a conversation in the background noise is different. Uh, I I mentioned on the In Residence review, that is something that's incredibly hard to do, right? Uh, sound is one of the, you wouldn't necessarily expect that to be the hardest part of filmmaking, but honestly, I think for independent filmmakers who are not experienced in that and don't necessarily have the greatest equipment, that's the thing that's the easiest to fail. And honestly, I think, you know, that's, that's not the case for the whole film, um, but it, but it is for a good portion of it, maybe even the majority of it. Um, so much like in Residence, I would suggest that you don't uh, listen to this with headphones. It might be a little easier to take, a little more digestible without headphones. Um, but but again, I don't, I definitely don't fault that. Um, if you have, um, you know, a, equipment that's not the greatest, if you don't know how to, if you don't have like a real sound ge- engineer um, who can mix out that, uh, that you know, background noise, the room tone or whatever you want to call it, um, then it can be very hard. And in addition to that, once you've recorded something and it turns out that the recording is not very good, like the the audio recording is not very good, that's it. Unless you can reshoot it, there's really nothing that you can do. Unless you're, again, like an audio genius and, and that's... That's just not the sort of thing that a lot of independent filmmakers can have uh, access to, because if you're that good at it, then, you know, you're working in some kind of audio, audio engineering field. You're, you're doing, you know, music recordings, you're working in theater, you're working in movies, whatever it is. Once you get a certain level of ability, you can generally find a place um, for yourself, even if you don't necessarily have like uh, a degree or something that is a field that that like there is opportunity without education necessarily, um, which I find is not necessarily the case with uh, with other elements of filmmaking. So um, and not not necessarily filmmaking, but any kind of entertainment and industry thing. I feel like that's one of the areas where you can still have a career without actually having the you know if you can show them that you can do it, then you can do it. And and that's not necessarily the case with every other aspect of 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 uh the entertainment industry in addition to probably not being like the most common skill set uh 
you know, that, that, that you can find out there. Another problem with it is that uh, it seems like they were filming uh, some of the scene, some of the scenes with uh, different, different cameras and uh, different like aspect ratios and, and, and resolution. Uh, sometimes the, the shots are, are clearly stretched to fit the same, um, the same dimensions as, as uh, the rest of the film. And it is noticeable. It's definitely not the worst of that that I have seen, but uh, but it it is there. But again, these are things. These these are things. You know, if you're if you're big borrowing and stealing equipment, you know, if you had access to a camera during this portion of the filming, but you couldn't get the same camera, the same type of camera on another one, and the new one doesn't have as good of um, resolution, or it doesn't, you know. It, it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's minor to me. That's, that's minor again, considering all of the aspects of it, the, the budget and, and that like n- nobody seems to have been backing these people. I am fairly certain, though not positive, that Rising Films is, uh, Daniel McGuire's own like production company. Uh, and not like it, it's not like they had the, like, producers or anything like that um as far as i know meaning they you know they diy this one for sure the acting isn't too bad some of uh most of most of uh, daniel mcguire's performance uh i liked quite a bit um especially so like i said they're sort of trying to piece together what's what's happened in this movie and uh daniel mcguire's character uh dominic is talking to uh is talking to somebody trying to trying to work out what happened essentially by discussing it with somebody else so a, a fair amount of the film is done with uh th- this this narr- narration over over everything else but you know that technically he's actually like in that room talking to the person what i like about about this you know a lot of people don't necessarily like narration but i think it makes it more that digestible that it's not just narration for no reason um it's narration because he's discussing it with somebody else. It's just that they're not showing him in that room every single time discussing it with that person. Instead, they're overlaying it with footage of, um, you know, sort of flashback footage, I guess. Um, but beyond that, uh, the the writing of these lines, the, specifically the narration parts, are really, really good. And one of the one of the good things about that, because there is a it, there's a fair amount of it. It, it. It's definitely not over every single minute of the of the movie. And there are probably some 10 or 15 minute stretches where you won't get any of it. Maybe more, maybe longer even. But uh, it's very prosy. And the way the way that it that, that things are worded in sometimes people lay it on a little bit too thick. I feel like when they try to do that, if they're not like experienced writers or anything, and I have no idea what his experience is. He could have been writing since he was, you know, able to hold a pencil. Um, but it it's pretty polished. I, I, I like a lot of the language and his delivery, you know, probably owing in part to the fact that he wrote the script himself, um, is, is very good. His delivery of those lines is excellent, in my opinion. Certainly it's, it, you know, it's probably not realistic to what a person going through, through that with a, you know, somebody unprepared off the cuff speaking to somebody is going to sound like, but again, that's not really uh, totally necessary because they don't spend the time in the room. They're not doing it in that, in, you know, they're not showing him saying the stuff in that room. And when they do go into the room, his speech definitely shapes up a little bit to being a little bit more, um, realistic and so that also helps with the digestibility, even though, you know, somebody who's speaking very flowery is probably not going to switch back to speaking more normal in real life. But for the purposes of the movie, it was the right choice. To me, it was the right choice. And the audio quality on that voiceover, I thought was really good. Um, so the person that he's supposed to be talking to, I figured I should just note this. Um, it was all over the comments for this movie, of course, but uh, the person that he's speaking to totally looks like Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> so, uh that's pretty cool. Um not necessary in in any way to mention, but I feel like I just should. It's pretty it's pretty like not funny. Like, you know, a guy looks like what a guy looks like. It doesn't matter, but it, it I don't know. It's it's pretty funny. He looks a lot like him. Some of the problem that I that I had with some of the acting is I feel like while most of the line delivery is pretty good from most of the characters, um, I feel like 
nobody is emoting very much. You know, there, there's not a whole lot of facial expression. And certain characters that makes more sense for, um, at least at certain points in the story, depending on what their mental state is supposed to be in the story, it makes sense. But at other points, it feels like you should really be a lot... So some of the characters should be a, a lot more um, animated, I, I guess. And, and sometimes you don't get that. But that's, you know, it's far from it's far from the worst that I've ever seen. Uh, and again, you know, these are probably most likely friends of this person or maybe got paid a little bit of money to do this. Um, I, I don't know what their casting process was, obviously. But, um, you know, it takes people time to... Uh, you know, adapt, adapt to, to acting and stuff. And, and as far as like, like, I'm, a, I'm just going to go ahead and assume these, the people in this movie probably haven't been in, in a lot of other movies, um, or at least hadn't been by the point that they were in this movie, but it's still like for, for, um, inexperienced actors, it, they are some of the better performers that I've seen in independent films, uh, in, in really independent films. I'm not talking 500 days of summer or whatever, where you get, you know, Joseph Gordon leave it. That's not an independent movie. I'm talking like real, actual, independent filmmaking. So the lighting, the lighting is pretty, um, sometimes it, it looks a little, you know, washed out or whatever. And there's no color correction in the movie, but none of that's really to me, like, uh, it's not really an issue. Um, I was, I was glad that I was able to see everything and there wasn't anything particularly weird with it. The lighting, there was actually a few shots. Uh, with the lighting that were really, really good. And one was very important to like really sell where they sort of um, zoom in on, on this object and that particular shot, the, the item, I don't know whether that was just luck or if they were really careful about it. I don't know, but that looked really, really good. That particular, that particular shot. There's actually a number of shots where it feels like you can almost see I feel like bo both based on like the audio quality and the ambitiousness of the camera work that it seems like you can see what was filmed first, like what stuff was when they were still sort of figuring things out a little bit more. And when they started to get more confident, uh, like the stuff, like I said, in the um, in the initial locations, the uh, m the main location, the one that you spend the most time in, it's this house. Those ones seem like they probably were shot first. And I, of course, don't know if this is true, but um, it looks like those might have been shot first, just merely based on how sort of careful it is. And it's not, they're not trying to do anything out of the ordinary. They're just trying to make sure that they get what they need and, you know, and work with it. And then later, in, in not necessarily later in the film, uh, it is more frequent later in the film, but in other sections, it's clear, like, you know, they actually try panning the camera in certain ways and like, putting a little bit more thought into uh, what type of camera movements and, and stuff like that they need. Uh, what I will say about even the initial, the stuff that I believe was shot first, it felt like all of that, all of that camera work, there was, there was very minimal shakiness. I didn't, I didn't notice any, any, you know, any excessive level of that. And I feel like that's what I've seen the most, uh, th that's one of the most common problems with those movies. So whoever was handling the camera, was was uh did did a very good job with that with you know keeping it steady and you know i know they don't have a steady cam or anything like that uh or i'd be very surprised if they did so uh yeah yeah i, I thought the camera work specifically was very well done even though you know it, some of it is very is very straightforward um the stuff the stuff even the straightforward stuff like at least it it's very it's very um clean uh, i i guess is is the way to put that as I said, though, the story, the story is probably the most interesting part. Um, I do think they could have used filming some, uh, some more, um, it's hard to talk about without like getting into spoiler territory, but there is some more like emotional scenes that they could have filmed and added into it to like sort of show the emotional impact of, of some of the scenes that are happening, like to give more emphasis to them, even though, you know, they don't gloss over these things, like how people would feel, but they really could like with a, a little bit more work, you know, focus on that particular uh, aspect. I feel like they, they, the movie would have, would have been improved for it. I don't think you're missing it. You understand, um, you understand what's happening and, you know, it's not like they're glossing over any of that stuff, like I said, but but uh, I, I think it would I think it would make it feel more um, 
I don't know, visceral. I think you'd connect with with it and with the characters a little bit better if they were a little bit better at at um, focusing on on those reactions. But that that's just a that's just a personal thing. Um, the story itself, as I said, very good. Most most of the dialogue is okay, but of course that narration that I mentioned that that is the the you know outstanding feature to me. The story itself, like the plot, uh, the plot arc. Uh, also, also really interesting. Um, definitely feels like a plot arc you could see in like a full actual like big budget picture. So that that's that's very impressive. Oh, one of the one of the problems that I I, I did want to mention about about the acting is I felt like there really could have been more chemistry between um, some of the characters. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a sort of minor problem because the the characters specifically that I'm that I'm thinking of uh, they. They are sort of going through some stuff uh, between the two of them. There's like some problem between between their, um, you know, sort of relationship to each other, and and so it, it it's not as though it's not as though it it doesn't make sense. It just still feels like there should be like there there are moments of of being less you know at you know at odds with each other. I feel like it, should, it would have been nicer to have their to have their feelings for each other seem a little warmer, I guess. Um, but again, these are all these are all minor things. I honestly think that that a lot of people would enjoy this movie. Um, I don't know about the other cut whether, uh, you know, whether that one is better or worse or whatever. I would assume, honestly, um, just based on like uh, spending as as long as this person, you know, the first one was released in 2012, and this one was released in 2017. So I'm sure. That the uh, uh, that Daniel McGuire, who is also the editor um, for this movie, I'm sure that he's learned a lot um, since you know in the intervening five years. So I would assume that the, the this cut is probably better. But I would be interested in still seeing Psychopaths from 2012 just to compare and contrast them. Um, I kind of wish I had watched that version first, but I didn't realize. It seems like I said that it's qu- it's a bit different. There were characters and stuff listed in the credits for that movie that. Uh, that weren't in this one, or at least I don't re- recall them being in this version. So it seems like they might have taken out some unnecessary stuff and and rewritten it. No idea if any of that's true. This is all just me making assumptions. But uh, but yeah, I don't know. I would I would suggest this if if you have um if you have any interest in independent filmmaking, if you like seeing what somebody can accomplish with a small budget, uh, I I think this is a pretty good example. Um, it's definitely not going to be the best movie anybody's ever seen. But uh, but I think you know I was I was decently impressed with this movie, and I I would definitely be interested in seeing something else that uh, Daniel McGuire had written for sure. If he you know if there's another thing, there's actually an, a short film on that Rising Films page too that I'll probably end up reviewing at some point. Just just uh, just based on the back of that writing, um, I would also be interested in seeing uh something else that he directed. But um, but you know, like I said, the the, the story is what I really liked in this one. It manages not to feel like every other single movie out there um, that that's, a, you know, based on the same, you know, sort of subject matter that this one has. So, yeah, I don't know. Just just generally, um, just generally, uh, I, I, I would be interested in this. And, you know, I've mentioned this a bunch of times on the show, but but uh, I really I really enjoy independent films. I like short films. I like, you know, not that this one's a short film, but. But, uh, you know, I like seeing people, people doing things, you know, I've, I've had, there are so many problems with Hollywood horror movies. I, I, I feel like, you know, although I, I have found, you know, since starting this project, I've found a number of modern horror movies that I actually really, really liked. Um, but I still feel like most of the really big budget, you know, well received, well, maybe not even re- well received, but big budget, you know, hu- huge advertising budgets and all of this stuff. Those movies, a lot of them are just, they, they, they lack a certain sense of personality. Uh, often, I'm not saying every time, but they often lack a sense of personality or they're about stuff that's honestly to me is just stupid. Um, the, the whole paranormal activity series, I, I have no, I granted I've never watched one, but like Starting with, at least I know the first one was about um, EVP, about uh, electronic voice phenomena, and turning into this whole actual horror, horror movie just seems like a little bit unbelievable to me, being like a general skeptic and an atheist and, you know, all of that stuff. 
you know, or, or, or there's just those movies that are churned out year after year after year. There's just a new movie every single year, which again, I think, you know, paranormal activity is kind of that. Um, but you know, so is Saw and, you know, a number of other movies. Uh, I, I just don't really have any, have any interest in those, or at least so was Saw. Actually, they stopped for a little while and then they just released one this year, which I haven't seen. I've only seen the first three and boy, I like the first, I liked the first one. I don't even know if I watched that again, if I would enjoy it just based on how bad the other ones are and everything. But, and again, that was sort of at the, you know, when it was made, it had a much bigger budget than, than this movie did, but that was, uh, it, that was still a pretty small budget movie. They got Carrie Elway's to be in it, who ha- I think hadn't been doing a lot of work at the time. And I love Carrie Elway's. He's, um, uh, Wes- Wesley from, from Princess Diaries or Princess, sorry, not Princess Diaries. <laughs> The uh, Princess Bride. But yeah, I mean, these, it, you know, they much bigger budget, but still a small budget independent movie. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much all, all I have to say about Dead Eyes watching. Um, again, if you like independent movies, if if you're interested in seeing what somebody can do with a small budget, if you are a filmmaker, um, I always think it's a good idea to watch other people's independent films to give yourself some pointers on like what you feel like works and doesn't work when when you're working when when you're working around somebody's budget like if you know that you're going to be able to do a movie and it's only you know your maximum budget is ten thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or whatever it is and you watch what somebody else does with that i feel like not only can it give you ideas on what works but it can make give you ideas on what doesn't work and i think that's great i think it's a, a really good exercise for uh independent filmmakers um to do but of course you don't have to be an independent filmmaker to enjoy that so and again, this is free uh, f- and legal on YouTube. So yeah, I would I would definitely suggest checking it out if you have interest in any of those things, um, or if you're you know intrigued by the 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 writing or having like the prosy narration. I think that's cool. You can at least you know you can at least check it out. If you if you don't make it to the end of the movie, I you know it it is what it is, I guess. But I, I enjoyed it. Uh, so that's my review of Dead Eyes Watching from 2017. So the other movie that I wanted to talk about today is, uh, this was a foreign Friday selection, um, from India, uh, and it's called Hiss from 2010. Um, that's Hiss with three S's. So this one was pretty bad on like a lot of different levels. I- I'm probably not going to spend too much time on this review, which is why I, uh, di- I did this, uh, I did this one. I-, I really need to start, uh, you know, get this up and then go to bed because I'm already starting to cut into, you're getting close to cutting into, you know, my sleeping time at this point. So, and also because, um, it it was pretty disappointing to me and probably doesn't have much appeal for anyone, I think. So it's really just not going, you know, worth going into too far. Sadly, I was kind of looking forward to this one and had planned um, to to watch it. Like I, I heard that it was coming on Netflix. Like I got I got like a notification saying this will be out on whatever, and it sounded really interesting. It, and that may have colored my opinion of this and and made me think of it a lot better because I did come in with like some anticipation. But that doesn't really change the technical problems or the very obvious flaws in the storytelling of this movie. Now. This this is, as I said, a movie from India, but this is not like a, a really small budget movie. So it definitely doesn't get the same level of consideration that, uh, you know, that that is something like In Residence or something like Dead Eyes Watching is going to get from me. It it, it has a, a Irfan Khan, I'll, uh, before I synopsize this, I'll say Irfan Khan, he's, he's a very uh, popular actor. He's been uh, in a lot of stuff in Hollywood and in uh, India as well. And, uh, he's a really big deal over there. He's pretty, he's a fairly big deal here as well, but, um, he's in this, so that's the level of budget they're working with. They're able to get Irfan Khan in and he's much too good for this movie, to be completely honest. So his tells the story of a snake goddess named Noggin. When her lover is snatched away from her by an American bent on stealing her immortality, the goddess takes on human form to get him back punishing all manner of terrible people along the way. So the first thing I feel like I should note about this is that Noggin spends more than the first hour of the movie not doing anything that can really be described as searching for her lover. Uh, Mostly she just seems to float around the city, uh, running across people doing bad things and killing them. Sure, you know, there there are some like longing looks and so forth, um, 
but pining isn't really terribly useful to her, like, supposed investigation, and it's it's definitely not helping him out. Who knows, like, if they're going to do something to harm him or something, if you're really worried about that, then I feel like y- you would hurry it the fuck up a little bit. <laughs> Speaking of investigations, uh, the majority of this movie takes on the perspective of a detective, he's the one who uh, Irfan Khan plays, um, that's looking into the bizarre murders that keep cropping up. His investigation is just as much of a joke as hers, wholly consisting of him visiting crime scenes in the morgue and, like, telling his partner that there's no way that a snake is doing these killings. Khan has no leads, he doesn't interview witnesses, draws no meaningful conclusions from the evidence, and spends most of the time simply brooding over the situation while doing nothing to stop it or find the killer. Neither of them are doing anything for most of the movie. It's just like, this stuff is happening, and then, I I don't know. When he finally does stumble onto the right track, it's due to something so ridiculous that information from a psychic would probably be more believable to me, honestly, which is ridiculous. I mean, I'm not talking about in the context of a movie. I'm saying if a real-life detective is, like, we're stuck and starts talking to psychics about, you know, for for new clues, like, that, which does happen in real life, sadly. Um, Well, I don't know. It has led to some discoveries, whether you believe it's totally bullshit or... If you, uh, if you believe it was sort of coincidental or if they told, she told them what they wanted to hear, or he told them whatever. But re- regardless, it's neither here nor there, so. All of this is despite the fact that the movie is played like a police-centric mystery slash crime drama rather than a horror movie. There are plenty of horror visuals, but the narrative is rooted in this police investigation angle, and the writer is totally inept at selling that angle. The poor dialogue and shameful attempts at building in human drama made even Khan seem like a less capable actor than he is. And he's a big deal, like I said, in both U.S. and India. I know he's a good actor, and I usually like him quite a bit. Uh, But it's hard not to come off a little wooden when you spend an entire movie following the trail of an apparent serial killer, but seemingly making no attempt to intervene in any of it. As to the technical aspects... Um, the effects are not half bad in some places and pretty awful in others. I, I was able to dismiss that as you know, sort of par for the course in a movie like this um, without a whole lot of distress. But what I couldn't tolerate was the editing. This movie has some of the worst editing I've seen in a movie with this high of a budget. In the first few scenes, there is a cut every two to five seconds with terrible fade outs um, to transition to the next shot. The shots fade to black either too quickly or don't stay black long enough, depending on which way, you know, you sort of feel about it. And and a lot of the shots should have been hard cuts anyway. The extremely short length of the shots is also unnecessary and actually started giving me a touch of a headache. When the movie keeps moving and, and finally realizes you can use shots that last for whole minutes without fading to black, without being arrested, um, it starts to have the opposite problem of making hard cuts in the wrong places. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I just stopped paying attention to these problems or, or if it actually made some kind of marginal improvement over, you know, the, the first half of the film, but the editing did start to seem a little bit better as it went on, um, at least up until the end. So one of the most fascinating elements of this film, because I did, I did do a little bit more research into this than I generally would have, just based on, like, I didn't understand why this was quite as bad as it was. I felt like there was there was a movie here at one point, and then it became whatever this mess was. Um, and it turns out the director, uh, who's a woman named Jennifer Lynch, she quit the film during editing when the producers tried to change the film to sort of suit their own, you know, vision of it rather than hers, making it a horror movie rather than the love story that she had envisioned. And that probably explains a lot about both the editing and the clunkiness of the film as a whole. Personally, I give Lynch, like, a full pass on this one, because the sort of editing we're talking about would totally destroy what could have been uh, a very good movie. Even before I read that that little tidbit, I felt that, that scenes that worked best were the ones that felt like they came from a different movie. And now I think the movie that, that I, I kept seeing might have been Lynch's original concept for the movie. And honestly, like, that love story angle, you can see 
little teeny parts of it in there. You can definitely see that that's what they were trying to go for. And yeah, it can be a love story and a horror film. And I honestly think this, this script or not, sorry, not this script. I honestly think that this concept lends itself very well to that. I think it would have been a really neat sort of deal. Apparently a documentary was made about Lynch's attempts to make this movie uh, s- something similar to Lost in La Mancha or like Lost Soul, I assume. I- it's called Despite the Gods. Now, I am planning to watch this probably sooner rather than later. Um, I haven't been able to get my hands on a copy yet because despite how awful this movie is, some parts are good enough that it's clear there was more going on than you can actually see from the outside and from the finished product. Yeah. I, I, I'm, it, it just sort of breaks my heart a little bit, much like Lost in, in La Mancha, honestly, which, um, if, if you're not familiar with that one, that was a movie, uh, a documentary that they made about, I believe it was Terry Gilliam trying to make a version of Man of La Mancha, which, and, and my memory is very fuzzy, but, but I think Johnny Depp might have been attached to it. And they, they filmed a good portion of this movie, and then everything, the whole world collapsed on them, essentially. And the movie, I mean, again, this is one of those things, like, you might consider a movie curse. It's so bad. So much bad stuff happens. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong in this in the production of this. Um, and it, it, it's a fascinating documentary if you're interested in filmmaking in any capacity. But uh, especially, you know, if you're into Terry Gilliam or Man of La Mancha or any of that. I have heard, and I don't, rem- I don't know if this is still true. A lot of times, the stuff happens, and they end up, um, you know, they they say say one thing, and then it doesn't, you know, stuff falls through. But I heard a rumor that they are finally trying to remake this with the original filmmakers uh, attached to it, trying again. Um, I think this documentary definitely is part of that. The Lost in La Mancha documentary, I'm sure that had some effect on on their wanting to try this and and there being an interest in trying this again. Uh, And I, I am so on board. If they, if they make that, I will definitely go out and see it in the theaters, whether it's in an independent movie, independent theater, or whether it's in, in full theaters. Luckily I do, there are in my particular um, area, there are a couple of independent movie theaters. So um, back, back to Hiss. Uh, Another problem with the movie was the awful dub of the American actor. So the actor spoke his lines in English, which was dubbed in Hindi, but the voice actor is putting on this terrible, gruff voice that the actual actor is clearly not using. Every time he spoke, I kind of winced. This guy is pretty much speaking his lines straight, uh, except where it actually makes sense to be animated, and it's coming out like a Hindi Batman. Uh, It's really distracting, but luckily his scenes are mostly confined to the beginning and the end of the movie, so... It's a small mercy, I guess. Probably the part that was the most perplexing in a vacuum was a foot chase in the last half hour of the scene. So the chase was at least three times longer than is really justifiable. But beyond that, I actually didn't even realize it was supposed to be a chase in that like compelling, exciting sort of way people intend chases to be in movies until Khan started jumping up the walls in an alley. And that was possibly more than a third of the way into the chase. Uh, it's pretty difficult to fail this hard at a simple chase scene, but somehow they completely managed. So I, I guess that's, uh, that's about all I can really stomach, uh, as far as talking about this movie. Um, if they do come out with a director's cut of this movie, I will probably give it a watch, but I definitely won't be watching this version ever again. This movie has some truly incredibly gorgeous shots, and the bones of it are an, are an interesting story, but parts of this movie are just unconscionable. I can't, I can't recommend the documentary about this movie because I haven't seen it, but I have a hard time believing it could be worse than watching this movie, and I certainly want to watch it. You can find Hiss on Netflix still, I think, um, or, you know, maybe watch something better. <laughs> I don't know. Um, as far as the, the documentary, no idea. Uh, I think it's on, I'm pretty sure it's on D- DVD. I know I looked into it, um, back when I did this initial review, but at this point, I I have no memory of it. Um, I just knew that it wasn't something that was immediately accessible. It wasn't on um, any of the the streaming sites or anything that I have, so. Uh, So anyway, that's my review of Hiss from 2010, and uh, that's the episode, I guess. Uh, Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, um, please share it with someone that, that you love or that you think would be interested in the podcast. 
And of course, rate, review, subscribe, comment, whatever it is for on whatever site that you found us. If you'd like to reach out to me on social media, you can do so on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, or you can email me at reclusehorror at gmail.com with, an- with any questions or comments. But uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Have a great night and uh, goodbye.